Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Esri Education Summit. I'm Angela Lee, and I'm the Education Program Manager at Esri. We're so excited to have you join us to share ideas, celebrate good work, and be inspired. There are nearly 2,000 educators from around the world participating in the summit this year, which I think is absolutely amazing. In this higher education plenary session, we'll explore the intersection of design thinking and GIS education. For some of us, the connection is clear if you know that Esri evolved from Jack Dangerman's experience at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. For me, it was less clear until a year ago when suddenly we had to find new ways of doing ordinary things to design new routines. Last year at this event, Jerry noted how the phrase building the airplane while we fly it had become so common. I think that's a great illustration. We don't know exactly what to do next, but we have a general idea where we're going and we'll make up improvements along the way. Definitions of design thinking often mention empathy, creativity, nonlinear thinking, visual representations, prototypes and iteration as important components. It's often multidisciplinary in nature, drawing on connections and analogies between seemingly unrelated ideas. And it's focused on developing solutions, applying ideas to make positive change. So how does this relate to GIS education? Well, GIS is widely used in the design fields such as landscape architecture, urban planning, engineering. But I actually want to flip things and bring a design mindset into GIS and other fields. For many years, we've talked about geo-enabling other disciplines. But how do we demonstrate the value of GIS to people in business, health, history, data science? How do we convince them it's worth learning? I believe that by understanding the needs of a business person or historian and what problems they're trying to solve, we can design apps that fit their ways of working. We've also talked for several years about moving to modern GIS, but what is that? I think it's exemplified by the phrase, there's an app for that. It's an ecosystem of tailored mobile and web apps that meet the needs of specific people because they've been designed for them. It's a world of apps with intuitive user experiences, not toolbars with 30 buttons. In this era of modern GIS, Someone needs to design those apps. This means someone needs to collaborate with the business person or the historian, understand how they approach the world, and blend the capabilities of GIS with that approach. This means many GIS professionals will be app designers. In fact, we all can create or tweak apps to better meet our needs. I think there is an opportunity both for GIS professionals to apply design thinking to craft tools for students and scholars in diverse fields, as well as an opportunity for people in those fields to apply GIS using a design thinking mindset. GIS provides the visualization and analytical capabilities that support idea generation and iterative testing of hypotheses and solutions. Through collaboration, we can truly geo-enable every discipline helping to advance knowledge and apply it for positive change. Now, Jerry will share some ideas for enabling GIS throughout institutions through collaboration. Thanks, Angie. And there's, so there's a lot that goes into geo-enabling campus communities, a lot that we as educators can do, a lot that we as an education team can do as well. One of the first items when we think about geo-enabling campuses is this notion of the GIS is indeed applicable to every domain, to every discipline, to every field. And as part of this idea of modern GIS, it is exactly what we see here on the slide. There's an app for every need that fulfills our teaching or research objectives. 
And there's tons of apps that are out there. You see some of the more commonly used ones on the slide. So story maps, notebooks, field maps, hubs. These have democratized the way we do GIS. And there's lots more that are out there. These are apps that are simple, that are focused, that are intuitive, that again, serve either a research purpose and objectives that we have or our teaching or educational need that we have um, and so on. So it's important to recognize as part of geo-enabling a campus community that these apps, they are available to our campus constituents. Another important part of geo-enabling a campus is this notion of collaboration. And what do we mean by collaboration? We mean in this particular case, lots of things, of course, but in this particular case, we mean collaboration within the campus itself, right? Within the, the campus community itself that can take different shapes, different forms. So special shout out to all of our geospatial librarians and all of our geospatial support units out there that provide that kind of support for campus communities. And of course, lots of examples of interdisciplinary collaboration that takes place between offices, between faculties. And we'll see some examples of that in our plenary speak with our plenary speakers, instructional resource offices. Another important one is collaborating with our IT colleagues and stakeholders. As GIS has grown to be this institution-wide resource and tool available for everyone, it's important to work with our IT colleagues to help us manage it as such. It has grown out of single departments where sometimes we still see it happening. We as faculty kind of focus and still do a lot of, a lot of the administration and deployment and all, all of that. So we kind of want to collaborate with our IT colleagues to help with that. So it's important to collaborate as part of geo-enabling a campus community. And another big one, so another third one is this, um, the just our support as an education team to the community itself. And that has always been our mission as an education team. That has always, and will continue to be our mission. So we've done more events, more attention, a lot more direct contact, um, a lot more community meetings as well. And, um, and again, those will continue. And there's so, so, so many of you that have contributed to a lot of these either events or webinars and, and whatnot with your knowledge, with your know-how, with your lessons learned. So you will see on the next slide, there's quite a few institutions that have been part of this sort of community building um, that have, again, have joined us for webinars, joined us for meetings, have voiced an opinion, shared what has worked, voiced what has not worked. So we very much appreciate that and um, all of the, you know, giving back to the community and the, the lessons learned. So with that, um, we'll, Angie and Brian Baldwin, a little later, they're, go they're going to introduce our two wonderful plenary speakers, wonderful collaborators that have given a lot to the community. So I am thrilled to introduce Kristen Curlin, who is one of the people I most admire within our education community. Quite simply, Kristen is a dynamo. Kristen is a teaching professor of architecture, information systems, and policy at Carnegie Mellon's John H. John Hines the third College of School and Architecture and holds a courtesy appointment in civil and environmental engineering. Her research focuses on interdisciplinary collaborations in health, the built environment and spatial analysis using GIS and 3D visualization. She's also a past president of CMU's Andrew Carnegie Society and recently served as a trustee of Carnegie Mellon University. She also is the co-author of the GIS tutorial series of books, including GIS tutorial, GIS tutorial for crime analysis, and GIS tutorial for health. Kristen will share her thoughts about design thinking and innovation and how she puts them into practice through her teaching and research. With that, I'll hand things over to Kristen. Thank you, Angie. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So uh, that, was a, that was a wonderful introduction to design thinking. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, design thinking and GIS education and really the roots of it at Carnegie Mellon. So I don't know about you guys, but you know, I really had to think part on what is design thinking. You know, that term is being thrown out a lot and Angie gave a lot of really good um, terms that people are using with that. But I wanna jump in and give you a, a product design, design thinking, um, project that I am quite aware of. So at Carnegie Mellon, I do a lot of collaboration with Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And that's mostly on the geospatial side. 
But there was a lead designer of the high-tech medical imaging systems for GE Healthcare that observed that getting an MRI was a scary and traumatic experience for kids. So utilizing concepts from design thinking and human-centered design, GE Healthcare set out to change this experience for kids. So after um, ideation and observation, they created a prototype and tested it at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And this prototype was transforming MRI suites and CT scans into a kid's adventure story. So with colorful decals that are attached to the outside of the machine and every surface in the room, machine operators were also given a script um, to lead these young adventurers and patients through an adventure, not a machine. And so the result was that an experience was no longer scary for kids, but actually it kind of fun. And the number of pediatric patients needed to be sedated dropped dramatically and patient satisfaction climbed to uh, over 90%. Now that's um, an example of you know, human-centered product design. And then I started thinking about design thinking at Carnegie Mellon. And within the uh, College of Fine Arts, we have a school of design. And so I looked at the definition for a course that we teach called design thinking. And you can look at the description here and, and it's uh, talking about a lot of the things that Angie talked about, empathy, experimentation, whatnot. Um, but I wanna again, stress the collaborative user center process. And it's not just products as we know, you can look at design thinking for the solutions of social problems. And again, you know, framing the problem and collaboration is really at the core of this. And that's what I want to talk about on how we do that at Carnegie Mellon. The other thing that I found when I was getting ready for the talk was uh, Googling design thinking. And, you know, there wasn't really a definition in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, but of course, Wikipedia has uh, information on it. And I, this struck me that design was a way of thinking and the sciences can be traced back to Herb Simon's uh, 1969 book, the sciences of artificial. Now that struck a real chord with me because Herb Simon was um, one of our most favorite, fa famous faculty members. Um, he was an American economist. He was a political scientist with cognitive psychology. His primary interest was in decision-making within organizations and his research was noted for its interdisciplinary nature. And in fact, Herb Simon won the Nobel prize in economics in 1978 and then he also won the Turing Award in 1975. So if you're familiar with that, you know, the Turing Award is the pr pretty much the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for computer science. The picture that you see here is um, Herb Simon with Alan Newell, who was a researcher in computer science and cognitive psychology. And he was also at the Rand Corporation. So in um, 1955, they came up with a computer and the invention was the programming language for computers to model complex human problems, uh, problem solving processes that resulted in what they called a thinking machine and really is one of the foundations for artificial intelligence. So think about this, we're really using artificial intelligence a lot today in the world of GIS. Another thing that we're using today quite extensively are cloud technologies. And they, this started at Carnegie Mellon in 1982 with something called uh, the Andrew Project. And this initial phase of this was really just connecting hardware and software and wiring throughout campus for data and uh, workstations that were distributed to the faculty and students throughout campus. In 1994, this led to um, the Air Andy Project, which was wireless. And so this was really one of the first, uh, we were one of the first universities that was truly wireless throughout the whole campus. I just have to mention this because this is really cool. Um, I did not go to Carnegie Mellon, but I went to the University of Pittsburgh in the 1980s. And I remember my friends from Carnegie Mellon talking about this. This was, and this was, I just came across this in IBM, uh, in an IBM uh, blog. We, were, we developed one of the first internet of things at CMU. And it was basically a Coke machine. And it was a bunch of computer science students that were, uh, the Coke machine was a little too far for them to walk to check to see if there was Coke in the machine and what the temperature was of the Coke. So they used um, this technology of the, um, you know, connecting through the wireless from the Coke machine to their computers to check to see what the status was. And so I remember my friends saying, oh, the Coke machine is, you know, whatever temperature, don't go wait till, you know, it, it becomes cooler or whatnot. And this was a picture of this. So it's kind of interesting to see that, you know, the three things that I think that are really involved with Carnegie Mellon today, um, or the history of Carnegie Mellon are, that are relative today in GIS, um, really have 
in their heart de design thinking approaches. So if you think about complex problems that we deal with in GIS all the time, um, it does require these multidisciplinary approaches. And here at CMU, we believe that it's not just within the university, but external partners are very important. So I just want to talk about a few of those that we have. Uh, one of them is Metro 21. It's an institute whose basic uh, rule is to collaborate with the city of Pittsburgh, Allegheny County, and now the airport. So we actually have a memorandum of understanding that we will do the research and development at Carnegie Mellon, but we use the city, the county, and the airport as test beds for that, develop, that uh, research that we're doing. And so I'll talk a little bit about that with uh, GIS and some of the projects that we're doing. Uh, we also really, though, feel that it's important for citizens to be involved. And so I was recently just one of four faculty members that helped write a proposal to one of our local foundations. And I'm proud to say that Carnegie Mellon just got $30 million to develop the Center for Shared Prosperity. And this is where we have at the center of this um, at the center, the core of the center are going to be community members. And a lot of the work we're going to be doing is obviously going to be using GIS technologies. We're looking at housing, education, transportation, uh, you know, healthcare uh, to really improve the lives of the citizens of Pittsburgh. Um, and it's funny that this is an image for, we only had a few um, images in the proposal. And this is work that is, ha, has been done from Create Lab in our School of Computer Science. And this was looking at um, timelines and looking at data across time and different topics related to housing and inequities in housing. So this is just an example of how important this is that when we went to the foundation, GIS was at the core of what we were asking to do within the city. We also really believe that industry partners are important. Industry partners that we do with robotics, autonomous cars, healthcare. Obviously, Esri is really core at a lot of what we do. Uh, spin-off companies like Carta, which is 3D point uh, cloud technologies, was a spin-off from the School of Computer Science, but is really now heavily used in, in our world of geospatial technologies. But let me just quickly show you um, very quickly an example of how this interdisciplinary collaboration can come into play. And I'm just going to have this as an overall theme of the work that I do with creating healthy cities. So one of the things that I start with is collaborations with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and in particular, my work with Children's Hospital. So the advantage of this and the reason why this is important is if you're identifying areas of the city that have health problems, Getting record from the medical re uh, record is really important. From there, we will take that data and we will do GIS analysis. So we might map different conditions and I'll just show you a few screen captures of some of the maps that we create to start to identify where we have problems within the city. Then from there, we need to come up with policy solutions. And that's where we might work with the mayor's office or the city and other agencies. Um, maybe the Heinz College Students of Public Policy in a capstone project will address some of the problems that we found through the mapping. We will also bring in design experts from architecture to urban design. We have uh, collaborations with the Entertainment Technology Center. Esri was really critical with projects that we just did recently in looking at 3D designs. And again, in, in collaboration with somebody like a city planning department. And then from there, um, just tailoring some more of these Metro 21 projects, again, we might have, um, you know, solutions to traffic and air and lighting that we bring in with others on campus. So just quickly, if we look at mapping the health data, you know, the work that I've done is mapping things like obesity patients. And that is a patients over time from the Weight Management Wellness Center at Children's Hospital, or going to the emergency department and getting the data of severe pedestrian accidents. I also have been working recently with uh, medical fellows to look at using advanced tools like uh, multivariate cluster analysis to look at where we have environmental triggers for asthma or where do we have uh, poor health care for patients. Then from there, we start to come up with solutions and we might look at something like complete streets. And this was an initiative that the mayor had. We might look at using um, city engine or 3D quantification to look at what it would take to uh, make this change happen throughout the city. We've been working again with the Entertainment Technology Center to look at uh, enabling citizens to look at this in 3D with virtual reality. Back to some of the work with Metro 21, looking at uh, implementing these smart signals within the city. Uh, we also have simulations that we're doing within our School of Robotics to look at these traffic simulations. 
And then again, really, how do we implement these? So working with the mayor, you see uh, two uh, pictures here. The one on the left is we took a parking lot and turned it into a park, which is now connecting uh, the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. And then we also look at ways to maybe do traffic calming and have other ways to have these policy solutions implemented. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the players in the multidisciplinary collaborations that we see around design thinking. I just want to end here with talking about some of the innovations that we're doing at CMU in design education. Um, as Angie said, you know, um, you know, we really all reset ourselves last year and having to move into this um, online teaching. This isn't new for me. I've been teaching uh, GIS remotely since 1999. And so what I did was I took some of the asynchronous video lectures that um, I've made these available to everybody. So if you don't have them, feel free to um, contact me and you can download these. Um, and by the way, I'm going to be working on improving those, making them a little bit more interesting um, for the fall semester. But we realized that um, I realized going back this fall that I'm going to have to do still a uh, blended method of teaching. Part of that is because some of the computer labs that we have at Carnegie Mellon are now going to have uh, maybe half of the computers. Uh, they took out, uh, in, in fact, in one of our um, our buildings, they've taken out all the computer labs. And in others, they're really paring down the number of computers we have. So I'm planning on doing a blend of maybe uh, four or five live lectures uh, throughout the semester and then blending that with asynchronous lectures in between. The TAs and I are going to be holding both online and um, on site uh, TA hours and office hours. Um, another thing we've done at Carnegie Mellon is um, hired Chris Gorenson. So some of you may know Chris. He's well known in the GIS world. Uh, but Chris now is teaching GIS with me and advanced GIS. And the reason I want to mention this is Chris is using a lot of Esri's programs and Esri's Learn Lessons and MOOCs in his advanced GIS course. And so the having this um, method of teaching online really makes it more natural, I think, for us to then collaborate with the great work that Esri is doing with all of the um, learn lessons and the MOOCs. And even within my course, um, I have all of that interspersed now in with my live lectures as well. The other thing too that's making this happen is we have something called Virtual Andrew, which allows our students to log in to servers that are supported. They're servers that are hosting um, ArcGIS Pro and they're able to log in from anywhere, anytime. Um, that allows us to reach you know, students across campus. I just wanna very quickly uh, tell you here that we have students taking GIS from our studio-based programs. These are just some of them in the School of Architecture. Um, we've had, uh, between our undergraduate master's programs, this is just a list of the types of students that I've taught personally. We've had more than 150 sections of GIS with more than 5,000 students over the past 30 years. But you see they come from all walks of campus. I have you know, students in business, history, economics, robotics, et cetera, taking GIS. And that's because it's a tool. We don't have a geography program, but it's a tool within all of our programs. It's really prevalent in our PhD programs. And so I'm working right now with a PhD student, Susie Lee in the, um, in the School of Architecture, whose work is gonna be looking at smart neighborhood surfaces. And so um, Susie has at the core of her research, geospatial statistics, using things like model builders, but also looking at um, you know, creating all of these models. These are just some of the sketches from her, uh, her PhD proposal, um, but then also delivering this with dashboards. And so I think this is so important to know that we're not only doing this research, but we need to make that data available to others. And so a core of what she's doing is gonna be this dashboard deployment. And then finally here, um, you know, when we talk about getting others to learn GIS, Again, back in 1999, when I started teaching, I started teaching a course to physician executives um, and it's called Enterprise Data Analytics and it's teaching them the importance of GIS and health. That led to a short book that I've just uh, wrote and that should be out this September. It's called GIS Jumpstart for Health Professionals. And this is gonna be a five chapter book that um, starts to just um, introduce GIS to health professionals, but then gets them online and creating maps and dashboards. So this is uh, what I do here at CMU with health and medicine. And then lastly, it couldn't be done without other support. And we have two now GIS librarians. They just received a grant to explore geography and education. 
And um, that has allowed us to now reach out to not only us here on campus, but all of this has allowed us to reach out to all of our campuses where we teach GIS in all of these. So with that, I just want to thank you for allowing me to just talk a little bit about what we're doing here at Carnegie Mellon, and I encourage others to connect and collaborate. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was amazing. I just love the focus on kind of the interdisciplinary piece and also the, the range of backgrounds that students are coming from and the places that they're applying this tool to solve all these challenges. It's just a, a fantastic story of the, the places that GIS can be used. Well, thank you, Brian. And it's a joy to teach all of them. So thank you. Awesome. Um, so my name is Brian Baldwin. I'm a senior solution engineer on Esri's education team, and I help support our urban and regional planning initiatives and outreach. And through that work, um, it's been an honor of mine to be able to be introduced to Uva Brandis, and Uva is going to be our next speaker. Um, Uva is a professor of practice at Georgetown University, and he's also the faculty director of the urban and regional planning master's program as well as the university-wide Georgetown Global Cities Initiative. Brandis is a scholar practitioner with over 25 years of experience in planning, design, and development of new buildings, infrastructure, and parks. And his research grows across urban investments and changing contexts of demographics, ecology, and capital markets. He also works as the chairman of the District of Columbia Commission on Climate Change and Resiliency, and he holds a master's of architecture from Harvard, and uh, engineering science degree from Dartmouth College. And with all that said, Uva has been doing some amazing work at Georgetown. Really excited for him to be able to introduce and talk through some of the stuff that he's been doing. Take it away, Uva. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you so much, Brian. It is my great honor to be here. It's so exciting. And I'm going to go through this slide deck very quickly to see if we can squeeze in some, some dialogue at the end. Uh, so welcome. Um, it's my honor to be here. And uh, here's Georgetown in the middle of uh, Washington. And eight years ago, um, Georgetown decided to create a master's degree in urban planning. And that's um, where I come in. I was hired to create that program. And I'm just so glad to be presenting on the heels of, of Kristen's amazing presentation because our story is very different. Um, our university does not have an architecture school. We do not have an engineering school. We do not have a uh, geography department. Um, and so the creation of this urban planning uh, degree was a really a big step uh, for, for Georgetown to, to think um, differently. So here we are, Georgetown in Washington, DC, um, the creation of an urban planning program eight, eight years ago. Uh, the importance of cities globally, I think everyone on this call knows that. Um, but importantly, uh, while cities are always defined locally, um, increasingly we see practices, strategies, data shared globally. And so this is a radical transformation in the way in which local leaders have been thinking about their work. And cities themselves uh, are incredible vehicles of integration. And so picking up on Kristen's um, uh, excellent background on design thinking, cities force us to integrate many different things. And because of the challenges that we have in the world and because of um, kind of ideas of governance associated with uh, subsidiarity where decision-making needs to happen locally, uh, we really need to train um, a whole next generation of problem solvers to integrate uh, problem solutions. And uh, Kristen, I threw this in for you. Um, in our program, we, we really value leadership and we had the great opportunity to spend some time in Pittsburgh with former mayor of Pittsburgh, Tom Murphy, three-term mayor who really kind of shared with our students uh, what it's like to lead community change. So here's our campus. Uh, we're not located on the historic campus. We're actually downtown, um, right in uh, the middle of the business community. And I think the main point here for today is that we do not have a GIS lab. Uh, everything that we've been doing in our program has be, been decentralized from, from the beginning. Our curriculum, which you know we could have a long conversation about, um, is underscored 
with a firm commitment to teaching in a place-based, community-based way. And that's really this idea of forcing integration in all aspects of our curriculum. Um, as much as we love and value being in DC, there's no substitute for observing the challenges that cities have, whether it's in Raleigh, Manila, Wuhan, or in Baltimore. Our students are out trying to understand how integration happens locally. And we've built a um, community of practice in our program that really has students at the center with a number of networks surrounding them. And this idea of collaboration is something that we've built into the DNA of, of our curriculum. And you know the students, of course, uh, learn so much from each other in a peer-to-peer -peer basis, and also, of course, form lifelong bonds. And here again, the point is that the way in which we learn is so different today. And it's even, you know, coming off of the heels of the pandemic, been radically transformed even from where we were uh, 15 months ago. And again, almost all of the work in our program is uh, kind of completed in this format. Um, we are, um, again, not uh, equipped with big technology labs or um, GIS labs. So I just wanted to show you very quick examples of what our students are doing. And um, I wanna underscore how important it is that the Esri tools are enabling the way in which our students approach um, ur urban problems and not necessarily leveraging the ESRI tools to their full power. And uh, this is a kind of theme hopefully we'll be able to uh, talk about in a second. Um, here's a history project looking at the evolution of uh, gay neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. Um, here's a mapping project looking at um, uh, uh, redlining in the city of Rich Richmond and the impact that has had in the formation of demographics in suburban areas of the city. Here's a urban design challenge, taking an intersection and making it radically pedestrian. Um, students using uh, ArcGIS Urban to really think about the program mix of a future neighborhood, including uh, affordable housing as a, as a explicit strategy in, uh, in this case, a community that is um, very wealthy. Um, students using story maps in a way to explore cities that they will never have the opportunity to visit themselves. And this is really exciting. This is a, a student project um, that uh, is really driven by a series of hypotheses that um, would never be able to be uh, solved for through personal observation. Uh, our students are uh, obsessed with alternative transportation. Uh, we've done a series of studios in the program focusing on bikes and bike trails uh, in our region. Um, and uh, here are students working on basic uh, equity and access issues, trying to understand which neighborhoods have easy access to bike trails and which don't. And one of the byproducts of this work is that students have become experts uh, in um, uh, both understanding the problems, but also communicating them. And uh, the work in these studios has led to really deep and uh, transformative relationships with the advocacy community in Washington and with uh, numerous public agencies themselves. And here's a, uh, a more sophisticated project that a, a student um, used Esri tools for a master's thesis, looking at the equity of bike lanes in Washington, DC, um, looking at how <clears throat> um, banks can be, uh, 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 their, how their spatial distribution in, in, in the city can be understood in equitable terms um, using bike accessibility as, as a metric. And then thinking about really um, the spatial equity of infrastructure investments themselves, 
uh, in this case, um, making the point that uh, all of the, the bicycle infrastructure investments in the city have uh, a bias towards richer neighborhoods um, and more white neighborhoods and not towards uh, poorer neighborhoods and African-American neighborhoods. So within our program, uh, we've generated a lot of excitement within the university, and we're now using this student-driven approach to pivot and engage our faculty across the university. So the second hat I wear at the university is the leader of the Georgetown Global Cities Initiative. This is a faculty-driven research exercise where we are now looking to find uh, individual faculty who are already using uh, spatial analysis tools, and um, beginning to think about how to build an institutional structure uh, around them. Uh, we've come up with this report. We've been working actively with Esri, and I just want to underscore and uh, kind of maybe end on this note that um, it, it's, it's not only about the highest levels of sophistication, um, in adopting and applying um, ESRI tools. Just using the tools and integrating them into uh, existing curricula has really been a total catalyst at Georgetown. And, um, and I look forward to additional conversations that we can have. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you, Ure. That was fantastic. Thanks to Kristen as well. So we do have maybe just time for one question. And I'm going to ask, um, what levels of interactivity with your models do you create for design thinking collaborations? So in studios and courses like that, are you are you able to have you know a lot of interactivity? Do you see that as key to the process? And that can be to either Kristen or Uva. Uva, do you want to do you want to answer, or I can answer as well? But yeah. um, let me start off, Kristen, and just say that um, the tools themselves catalyze interactivity, and I'm so excited about that. And we're kind of progressing up the food chain here and learning how to le leverage the full power of, of the tools. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Kristen. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. And, you know, it's so important. I think you're absolutely right, um, Uva, that the tools are critical to this and they do lend themselves. So, you know, it's interesting that I see um, it depends on the project, too. You know, the work that I do in 3D, it's not only just, you know, the 3D GIS, but then how do we get that into virtual and augmented reality, not only with Esri's tools, but how to share. Uh, one slide that I did not have um, is a model. And uh, we did a 3D research project, and it was all about the interoperability of all of these tools. And I think that's really important to talk about. Uh, what role does GIS play into this? And then what role do other um, tools have. And you can even see Esri's join that in my world of architecture and engineering and construction management, you know, integrating the Autodesk products with Esri's products. And that just opens it up widely to all of these different kinds of collaborations. And, and I just add on to that, you know, using the Esri tools is part of a process of sparking the spirit of discovery. And one of the really exciting things happening at Georgetown right now is that we have students interacting with faculty in an entirely new way. It's so exciting. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic. Okay, I wish we had time for more discussion, but I think we'll have to leave it there. So thanks again, both Kristen and Uva. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. What is next for the summit? Uh, so we have two full days of user sessions, workshops and panels, and special interest groups. Um, the agenda and other details about accessing the sessions are available from the URL you see here. Uh, we tried to keep things simple, just use Zoom. It seems that many of you did not receive the reminder emails that went out this morning that had the details to get into these different sessions. But uh, on, 
on the web page here, you'll, you'll find an abbreviated version of the agenda with links that will take you directly into each of the sessions. And I know we've just barely started this conference, but I want to remind you that the user conference is coming up as well. Uh, and that includes the science symposium. So this year, the science symposium key speaker will be Dr. Healy Hamilton, who is the chief scientist at NatureServe. So that should be a very interesting presentation. And with that, we will take a break for about 14 minutes, uh, consult the agenda to see where to go for the next set of sessions. And I will back things up so that you can see that URL again. Thanks again to our speakers and we'll see you soon.